Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Africa podcast. I'm your host, Andy. Last episode, the despotic rule of Osekwame was undone by the unpopularity of his religious views and accusations of poisoning one of his political rivals. After being ousted by an uprising, he was replaced by the younger son of his arch-rival, Konado, the young Apoku Fofi. However, Apoku Fofi died almost immediately after taking the throne, leading to another young son of Konado ascending to the golden stool, Ose Bonso. And now that internal stability has been more or less restored, at least for now, Ose Bonso will once again prioritize the furthering of Ashanti interests through territorial expansion, at the expense of who else but the Fonti and their British allies. Season 3, Episode 13, The Battle of Anomabo. In 1807, the king of the Ashantis, Ose Bonso, lay awake in his bed in the royal palace. Or, well, let me pause. The Ashanti royal palace was constructed from an earthy clay that compacted into a thick concrete. The walls were thick, not easily penetrated by the sounds of the outside world. But tonight, it was not the sounds of the outside world, as the Kumasi streets outside were quite quiet, that kept Ose Bonso awake, but sounds coming from inside the palace. Next to the king's bedchambers lay the royal armory, a storehouse for the numerous ceremonial swords used in Ashanti civic ceremonies. Through the walls of his bedroom, Ose Bonso was kept awake by an imagined argument between two of the swords in the armory. One was the sword of the king, that represented the personal authority of the Ashantihene himself, and was used in ceremonies that were designed to showcase the king's individual might and greatness. The other was the sword of the dynasty, which represented the grace and power of the Ashanti royal family, and was used in ceremonies in which the king showcased his humility to his ancestors. In Bonso's mind, the sword of the dynasty claimed that Bonso had been playing favorites, and showing far too much favor towards the sword of the king. He was paying too much attention to his own power and ego, and had been neglecting his obligations to his family and ancestors. While the sword of the king tried to make a rebuttal, it was clear to Bonso after hours of imagined argumentation that the sword of the dynasty was right. The next morning, after this stressful and sleepless night, Ose Bonso arose as a new man. At least, that is, according to the Apai of Ose Bonso, an Ashanti epic poem that details the story of this king. However, this begs the question, what had happened to Ose Bonso in 1807 to cause such a stressful and epiphanic hallucination in the first place? Now we've reached the true start of our story. In 1801, six years before the stressful hallucination, the king of the Ashantis was not yet named Ose Bonso. Rather, he went by the same name he had been called since the day of his birth, Ose Tutu Kwame. Nor at this time was he truly Ashantahene, but in due time he would christen himself Ose Bonso and insist on using it as his proper name for the rest of his life. Since this is the name that has gone down in the history books, that is the same name we'll use here. Anyways, the not yet Ose Bonso had risen to the throne largely due to the efforts of his mother, the Ashanti Queen Mother Konado Yadom. And, given the tumultuous and chaotic nature of his placement on the Golden Stool, he enjoyed little true power throughout the early years on the throne. After all, from the years 1801 until 1803, it wasn't exactly clear who the country should consider the true Ashantahene. While Konado and her allies had taken power and driven their rival Kwame out of Kumasi, Kwame continued to claim to be the legitimate king of the Ashantis long after his retreat from the city. It wasn't until Kwame's suicide in 1803 that a new, undisputed ruler could be installed. And, with his mother in control of the capital city, Ose Bonso won the election to become the Ashantihene in a landslide victory. Despite struggling for years to bring herself into proximity of the golden stool through her son, Konodo, perhaps surprisingly, didn't really try to use her son as a vessel for her own power or anything like that. Apparently, after 1803, Konodo settled down into a role as a well-mannered, respected member of court life. She was still powerful and prestigious, don't get me wrong. She was the most important advisor to the king, and had forever altered the prestige and institutional status of the position of Ashantahema. But she didn't try to undermine her son's authority once he was on the golden stool. She even allowed, at her son's request, some of Osekwame's old allies, including the former slave-turned-minister of finance, Opoko Frefre, to stay in their positions, so long as they strictly disavowed loyalty to the old Ashantehene and pledged undying faith in her son. Konodo accepted her son's request for amnesty for these wayward ministers. She had achieved what she wanted, her son on the throne. With Osebonso secure in his position, 
Conan Doyle decided that it was time to allow her son to truly rule in his own right, and then proceeded to uncharacteristically uh, chill out, vanishing entirely from our records until her death a decade later. A fascinating ending for a fascinating woman. Anyways, well, Bonso is on his own now, truly. While he may have been a political pawn with little agency during his childhood, this wouldn't be the case for long. But if there was ever a bad time to be granted such responsibility, 1803 must have been among the worst. Now, you might have been wondering throughout these last couple episodes, as the Ashanti have been in political turmoil, what have their neighbors, and more importantly, their rivals, been up to? If you assume that they had simply been standing by and not taking advantage of the situation, you'd be wrong. Throughout the 1790s, while the Ashanti government had been preoccupied with the disputes and accompanying revolts of Konodo and Kwame, the Fonti had been busy increasing their own influence in the Ashanti's southern territories. Namely, they had given support to a group of nobles, primarily from the Denshira, but also from a small Lakan group called the Asen, a group that hasn't really come up on the show yet, but were integrated under Ashanti rule all the way back when Osei Tutu conquered the Denshira Empire. With Fonti urging, these nobles rose up in rebellion against their Ashanti overlords, declaring their independence from the rule of the Golden Stool. The Ashanti military, divided and preoccupied at the time, was more focused on these internal disputes than with this fairly minor rebellion in the south. So, at least for the time being, the rebel forces roved around the southern countryside, attacking Ashanti settlements and looting the buildings of the local Amanhenes. Most insultingly, at one point one of the rebels allegedly dug up some Ashanti graves to rob the corpses of valuables they'd been buried with, a taboo act in any culture, but especially among the Akan. The irony, of course, is that the Ashanti army did the same thing to Denshira graves during the reign of Osei Tutu, so perhaps to the rebels this was a bit of cathartic revenge. This catharsis wouldn't last long, though, of course. After Osei Bonso was officially installed in 1803, he declared that wiping out these rebels was the first item on his agenda. However, unusually for an Ashantahane, Osei Bonso decided that he didn't want to simply act as a mediator or advisor on military matters. Rather than following the tradition of delegating authority to lead the army to the Contehene, Osei Bonso decided that he himself wanted to personally attend the campaign, making him the first Ashanti monarch to personally attend his military exercises since Osei Tutu himself. And this was no isolated one-time decision. Osei Bonso would personally attend every major military campaign he ordered throughout his rule in person, and would even occasionally give orders on the battlefield. So, why did Osei Bonso decide to break this century-long tradition of delegation and attend his military campaigns in person? Well, personally, I'd wager that the answer lies in a distrust of the Ashanti bureaucracy. Remember, Osei Bonso had been a child or teenager when he witnessed everything that happened in the Ashanti government over the last two decades. The purges, executions, and revolts, he had seen it all, and it had probably left a pretty deep impression on him. Not to mention that, despite the relatively high turnover in bureaucracy during the time, there was still a decent portion of the governmental structure that managed to keep their positions throughout these decades of strife. That is to say, many of the bureaucrats he was supposed to trust to be his allies were the exact same people who he had witnessed quietly turn away and slyly pretend they hadn't seen anything when both his mother and Osei Kwame had been overthrown by military coups. I mean, if you were around back then, would you trust the Ashanti bureaucracy to stay loyal and do your bidding? Well, as we'll see, Osei Bonso certainly didn't. And, as they say, if you can't trust anyone to do something right, you do it yourself. Well, as everyone expected, the rebellious Denshira and Asen nobles, with their small militias, were crushed with ease by the significantly larger and better equipped Ashanti army. However, these rebels were not where Osebonso's trouble would end, but only where they would begin. Remember how the Fonti government had encouraged these rebels to rise up in the first place? Well, they weren't just about to leave their allies high and dry after such a devastating defeat on the battlefield. The Fonti government allowed the rebellious nobles and the remnants of their militias to flee into Fonti territory, where the pursuing Ashanti army couldn't follow them. This was a disaster for Osebonso, who had desired to make an example out of these rebellious noblemen. He sent an envoy in 1805 to the Fonti town of Abora, demanding that they surrender the ringleaders of the rebellion. The Fonti parliament considered the offer. Ultimately, they declined. They believed that handing over the ringleaders would be a bad look, and erode the trust of other Ashanti enemies and the Fonti's willingness to support them in times of trouble. In fact, to show they were really serious, the Fonti parliament ordered the execution of the Ashanti envoy. For Osei Bonso, that was the last straw. 
The Fonti's decision to execute his envoy was not only a flagrant insult to the Ashanti state, but also an insult to him as well. By executing the envoy, the Fonti were basically announcing, Oh, you want us to hand over our allies? Come and get them. It advertised their perception that, unlike previous Ashanti kings, Ose Bonso in particular couldn't defeat the Fonti in battle. And maybe they were right. Bonso was, in the Fonti's eyes, not even the real Ashantahane, just a pretender whose mommy had to do the heavy lifting to get him on the throne in the first place. They had held their own in a war against the respected and legitimate Ashantahane, Ose Kwajo, so they could definitely hold their own against a weak and illegitimate pretender like Bonso. Anchored by what he saw as a personal slight, Bonso invoked the Great Oath. This oath, known as the Intim Kesi in Chui, is an incredibly taboo phrase to utter, as failing to fulfill such a strong oath will make you into a social pariah. In a meeting with his ministers, Ose Bonso announced the oath. I swear by Tuesday, the day of the death of the great Ose Tutu, that the Fante will be destroyed. In May of 1806, Ose Bonso and the assembled Ashanti army lined up along their southern frontier, and then marched into the Fonti Confederacy. The Fonti, who were well aware that an invasion by the Ashanti was imminent, had aligned their own forces, primarily composed of local, municipality-based armies called Asafo, as well as the forces of their Denshira and Asen allies. However, knowing of the Ashanti's superior numbers, the Fonti and their allies allowed the Ashanti to advance, instead falling back and digging into defensive positions at the town of Abora. As the Ashanti approached Abora, the Ashanti and Fonti forward guards began an intense clash, with both sides experiencing heavy casualties. The Fonti had long known of the Ashanti's encirclement tactics, and had developed their own strategies to counter this doctrine. As the Ashanti wings swept forward on each side, the Fonti maneuvered to meet them. The wings were stopped in their tracks, and the Ashanti forces were now caught in an awkward, spread-out position. However, one of the Ashanti officers spotted a weak point in the Fonti army's lines. Perhaps due to a miscommunication, the Fonti's rear guard was positioned further back from the main force than it should have been, creating a gap. The Ashanti wings exploited this gap, rushing down the empty area in the Fonti lines and dividing the Fonti forces in two. As the Fonti hastily tried to plug the gap, the other Ashanti wing broke through the Fonti lines. Just like that, the tide of battle had turned, and the Ashanti had encircled the bulk of the Fonti army. The encircled Fonti didn't stand a chance. At the Battle of Abora, the majority of the Fonti military were either captured or killed. Including among the captured ranks were, importantly, two of the four rebellious nobles that the Fonti had been sheltering. The other two nobles, along with the remnants of the Fonti's rearguard, retreated back to the coast. The Ashanti army, meanwhile, celebrated this enormous victory by stripping the locals of many of their valuables, while capturing many as slaves. After Abora was thoroughly stripped of anything of worth, the Ashanti army advanced further south to the coast. In a panicked meeting, the Fonti parliament recognized that, with their army destroyed, they no longer stood any chance of victory, and agreed to surrender. Most of the Fonti forces stood down, while some continued to futilely resist the Ashanti's advance. Hearing of the Fonti's imminent surrender, the two uncaptured rebels realized that the Fonti could no longer protect them. Joining a crowd of thousands of terrified Fonti refugees and deserters, they fled to the forts owned by European trade companies, one to the Dutch in Fort Amsterdam, and another to the British Fort William at Anamabel. Already, Ose Bonso had achieved things that had vexed even the most competent Ashantahanes before him. He had defeated the Fonti, no easy task, and by the beginning of 1807, he had occupied pretty much the entirety of Fonti territory. Not long after, the Fonti Parliament assembled again and formally pledged submission to Ose Bonso and the Golden Stool. However, Ose Bonso couldn't truly proclaim victory until he had accomplished the task that had started this war in the first place, capturing all four of the rebellious nobles. Now, Ose Bonso, like all the previous Ashantahanes, had no desire for war with the Europeans. They were, after all, among his most important trading partners. In fact, in a meeting with the Fonti government before the war, all of the major European merchants on the coast had advocated against the execution of the Ashanti envoys, believing rightly that a war between the Ashanti and Fonti would interfere with their ability to trade with both sides. The British were especially terrified of a war breaking out because of their close relationship with the Fonti. If a war broke out and the Fonti lost, the British material support for the Fonti over the years could lead to the Ashanti seeking retribution, 
And as the Ashanti army rampaged through Fonti territory, it seemed to the British that their worst fears had come true. In 1807, the Ashanti army approached the British fort at Anamabal, having heard rumors that one of the rebels had sought harbor there. The local population of Anamabal, along with a few Fonti veterans, scrambled to form a militia to stop the Ashanti's advance, to no avail, and the city was captured after a crushing Ashanti victory. As the Ashanti army advanced towards Fort William, nearly the entire population of the nearby town, combined with numerous other refugees from around the Fonti Confederacy and the remains of the Anomabo militia, converged into a mob of 17,000 people in front of the gates of Fort William. There, they hammered on the gates, desperately pleading for protection from the approaching Ashanti force. The fort's governor, a British merchant named George Terrain, attempted to let in as many refugees as he could with about 2,000 refugees, including the rebellious noblemen, entering the fort before the Ashanti army, led by Ose Bonzo himself, appeared on the horizon. They had already convinced the Dutch at Fort Amsterdam to surrender the rebel leader to them without a single shot being fired, and hoped for similar success against the British at Fort William. With 15,000 desperate refugees still outside, Terrain ordered the gates shut. According to the statement of a missionary sheltered in the fort at the time, Touraine held little faith in the ability of the fort to withstand a long siege, and therefore sought to negotiate a favorable surrender with the Ashanti outside. However, upon trying to send an envoy to the gate, a group of Fontys inside the fort caught wind of the envoy's intention to surrender. Now, neither the British nor the Fontys knew exactly what the approaching Ashanti army wanted, so the Fontys in the fort believed, likely accurately, that the British envoy was about to sell them out and hand them over to the Ashanti to save their own skin. As a result, the Fontys inside the fort blocked the gate, and threatened to turn on the British if Touraine tried to send an envoy. Many of the 2,000 Fontys who had made it into the fort were armed, so these were no idle threats. Even if he and his soldiers in the fort could put down a mutiny from the Fonty inside, Touraine knew that this would waste valuable men and gunpowder. It would guarantee an Ashanti victory in the coming siege, while also depriving the British of leverage in negotiations. So Touraine relented. And, while the Ashanti waited outside, the fort remained silent. And, here's your reminder that while every historical figure on this podcast is interesting, being interesting does not make them good people. Since there was no sign of surrender coming from the fort, Ose Bonso decided to provoke a response by ordering his army to gun down the Fonti refugees outside the fort. While some of the Fonti were armed soldiers, most of them were unarmed civilians. The result was a massacre, with more than half of the 15,000 Fontys murdered. However, if Ose Bonso had thought that this massacre would compel the fort to surrender, he was wrong. If anything, it further convinced the Fontys inside that, if a surrender took place, their deaths were imminent. So no surrender came. Having had enough of waiting, Ose Bonso instructed his officers to try to capture Fort Williams. However, this would be no easy task. The Ashanti army was, by design, a mobile force. It was meant to move fast and encircle its enemies. Its soldiers were equipped lightly with rifles and lacked any artillery in its ranks. Additionally, the Ashanti had no experience besieging a fort of the magnitude of Fort William before, so Ashanti officers had no established doctrine of siege warfare. Now, European forts were not invincible. On multiple occasions, the Fonti and other southern Akan kingdoms, as well as the Ga at Accra, had managed to successfully besiege European forts before, but the Ashanti had no idea of what tactics these people used. As a result, Ose Bonso and his officers had really no idea of what to do about the enormous walls staring them in the face. Some ordered their troops to try to scale the fort's walls, while others commanded their soldiers to fire volleys at the defending British and Fonti soldiers. One Ashanti soldier attempted to set fire to the fort's gate, only for the falling corpse of a defender to land on the flame and smother it. While both sides suffered heavily, the brunt of deaths were suffered by the unprepared Ashanti besiegers. After six hours of intense fighting, both sides were exhausted. Even the governor Terrain was nearly killed on two occasions, with one Ashanti musket ball striking him in the arm and another in the mouth, splitting his upper lip in two and shattering four of his teeth. While the walls of the fort had held, only six hours of fighting had exhausted most of the British gunpowder, and the governor Terrain knew that if the fight kept up any longer, the Ashanti would eventually outlast the British. According to a missionary present, The wall was in an awkward state, completely blockaded on the land side, and with a very imperfect communication by sea, and only a few weeks' provisions for the number it contained. Add to which, the odours emitting from the dead bodies, which were approaching fast to a putrid state, excited very uneasy apprehensions. 
these circumstances demanded some extraordinary effort, which the garrison, from its weakness, could not attempt. So, over the protests of the fort's faunty defenders, Terrain flew the white flag of truce. As an envoy emerged from the fort to negotiate a surrender, the Ashanti army erupted into joyous cheers and singing. Accepting the truce, Ose Bonso agreed to meet Torain at a nearby courtyard, where terms of surrender were agreed. During the negotiations, Ose Bonso and Torain attempted to clear the air about the battle, with Bonso explaining to the governor that he had no quarrel with the British in specific, but that he simply wanted to extract a fugitive who was hiding in the fort. Torain, noting that he wasn't aware of this fugitive's presence, agreed to hand over the rebellious noble hiding in Fort William. From his advantageous position, Bonso extracted other concessions from the governor, including, importantly, a pledge that the chartered company that Terrain worked for, the British Company of African Merchants, would recognize the Ashanti's overlordship over the Fonti. Satisfied with the agreement, Terrain removed his hat and knelt before Bonso as a sign of submission, before returning to Fort William. He would then begin to search for the fugitive rebel leader. Oh, yeah, and in case you're wondering what happened to the 2,000 Fonti people seeking refuge in Fort William, Terrain decided that, since the Fonti state had basically collapsed anyway, he no longer owed any allegiance to the Fonti. He betrayed the refugees and sold them into slavery, with most of them being transported to the Caribbean. Yeah, this story is just full of terrible people doing terrible things. With the British surrender negotiated, Ose Bonso returned to consolidating and formalizing his conquest of the Fonti. He summoned a group of the members of the Fonti parliament to Anomabo, where they again agreed to submit to Ashanti rule. However, while the conquest of the Fonti was a monumental achievement, this specific meeting represented so much more. To the Ashanti, this conquest represented something that they had never truly possessed since their empire's founding. Straightforward and unimpeded access to the coast. Ose Bonso highlighted this aspect of the conquest throughout the day. During the submission ceremony of the Fonti elites, Bonso lifted the sword of the king, the same one from the start of our episode, and dipped it into the sea, declaring his overlordship of the entire ocean. At one point, the Ashantahene turned to one of his newly vassalized Fonti subjects and asked him, Tell me, what is the largest, most mighty beast of the sea? The Fonti noble replied that that would be the Bonso, or whale, the only animal capable of sinking a ship. From this, the Ashanti king turned to his spectating army and declared, From now on, my name shall be known as Ose Bonzo, Ose the Whale. To thunderous applause. As you can tell by the fact that I've been calling him Ose Bonzo throughout the episode, this nickname stuck around. So, with all this success, why at the end of 1807 was Ose Bonzo kept awake at night? Surely, having achieved all of his goals, conquering a people who had been the biggest thorn in the Ashanti side, Bonso should have been resting peacefully. But that's the thing. Bonso had achieved all of his goals, except for the goal that he had set out for. You see, while Ose Bonso and the Governor Torain had been busy negotiating Fort William's terms of surrender, the rebellious noble, the one who had insulted the Ashanti as a people by digging up their graves, had slipped out of the fortress before Torain could capture him. So, even though Ose Bonso had achieved so many of his own selfish goals, aiding his own glory, conquering land, and acquiring treasure, he had not protected his people's honor. Is it any wonder, then, that the sword of the dynasty felt like Bonso had neglected it? So, even after his monumental achievement of conquering the Fonti, Ose Bonso lay awake at night. However, his rule is far from over. Join us next episode as the troubles on the coast continue and Ose Bonzo receives an opportunity to rectify his failure. Thank you for listening to the History of Africa podcast. If you like the show and the free education we provide, then I'd encourage you to support the show. This can be done by a monetary donation to our Patreon, which can be found on our website, historyofafricapodcast.blogspot.com. By giving the show a review on iTunes, or by sharing the podcast to anyone who you think might be interested. This episode is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon, including the Caltech Sovereignty Club, Naomi Kanakia, Ayofagbamie, Kevin Johnson, Morgan Blackmore, Sean Burke, Sarah Mpenza, Tobias Tongland, and Dimitri, among others. Thank you all for supporting the show. It really means a lot. Oh, and on a side note, we finally reached 100 patrons on Patreon. That means that, at the end of the season, there will be a super-duper extra-long special episode about a topic voted for by our patrons. So, if you would like to support us, or if you already do, go to the Patreon page and cast your vote so that we can get your input on what the special episode will focus on. Thank you.